Hello and welcome. I am Gauharaza and you are watching Eureka. This beautiful planet called Earth is the only blue planet. It's a special in many senses. It's been going round the sun for millions of years. Life has started on it about four billion years ago. To be precise, it's 3.7 billion years. That is the estimate. It changed forms and we have, according to one latest estimate, about 8.7 billion different species. This beautiful, delicate, small ship has got passengers and huge large number of passengers man or human being is the latest passenger which has boarded this ship and in a very small period of time we have become threat to the ship itself anthropogenic activities have caused so much of turmoil on this beautiful blue planet that now people think that the diversity which we have inherited over a very long period of time is completely threatened. Today we have a very special guest in Eureka. Welcome Dr. Tania. Thank you very much. Rajasava Thank you. Channel. We are uh, honored to have you here for Thank two you. reasons. Number one, you are the first foreign scientist who has come on our program. This program has been showcasing Indian scientists, their work and their life. You are the first one. And you are the first African lady who is on our program today. We are really thankful that you spared some time for us. I'm honored indeed. But before I, I venture into your uh, life as a scientist and a science planner, uh, you were born in South Africa. That's right. Which was apartheid South Africa. Very hard times. Your mother was a communist and therefore it was a harder time for you. You had to leave South Africa to study. Do you have recollections of those days? Yes, I, I, I think um, having been born in Cape Town and anybody who's been to Cape Town will know it's a, a very recognizable landscape with the mountain and the very sea beautiful and very beautiful, yeah. Very and, uh, tabletop and, and all those areas. Oh yeah, and, and, and also having the had the privilege actually of my father being such a walker and a hiker and a lover of nature and beauty. And uh, in fact, for many years when I was, before I turned 10 and 11, we walked up the mountain, Table Mountain, almost every year, if not twice a year. I think I first climbed that mountain when I was about five or six or something with my father. So uh, I remember it very well indeed. And I also remember Sharpeville and the times of that massacre in the early 60s, uh, which really triggered my parents to have to When did you South become Africa. conscious that there is a color code, color barrier, and you can't very easily cross it? Well, the, I, I, come, I came from a very political family. It was the, 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 the subject at the table. Uh, it, politics the was at the table so it was all in the your time. Blood. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my parents uh, were part of a small group of, of activists in the 50s and we had meetings in our house and film reels uh, of films about uh, things that are happening globally that was banned in South Africa. So, yeah, it was really in our blood. And my mother being a trade So all the activities that were happening in the house were banned and, and, and you became conscious that these are the activities which are banned yeah. and you can't cross certain barriers. Well, yeah, except I... I and you I hated wanna, it. No, one of my early memories is my mother being very heavily pregnant and getting on a bus and and in the bus they had petty apartheid, as they called it, where black people had to go and sit in the back and white people sat in front. And my mother was very heavily pregnant and she sat in the white seats and then the conductor came along 
and said, no, you must move. And she said, no. And I remember thinking, oh, how embarrassing. I mean, I was about four or five. And, you know, that those are the things that your parents embarrass you on. And when I think about it now, I'm very honored and grateful that I had a mother like that who was so feisty and difficult and feisty. ready to fight yeah, ready to exactly. fight those barriers yeah. ready to fight the oppression itself but I was very privileged indeed I mean my my, my father was a teacher and my mother as I say was a was an activist in the trade union movement and I think that between both uh, activism and, and and intellectual pursuits and educational was pursuits, it hard was for you as a lucky. child was it really hard for you as a child um, because most of the activists who live in those conditions where the turmoil is a part of the life, also for children it becomes very hard. I think that many children of activists actually did suffer, but I, I, I think I was very lucky that, that there, there were other family members as well in, in that area. And also we... Um, we did lots of things, like, as I say, climb the mountain and go, go on camping holidays, etc., etc. My father being a teacher, they always had good holidays. So, you know, holiday time, you all went, went away. Cheap holidays, you know, that you go on a bus and go and camp on the beach and things like that. So, I must say, I only have good memories. And the memories of racism, uh, I think, is part of the character that you grow up to be. I mean, I wouldn't have it any other way. I wouldn't have any other history. I think it makes me more sensitive to other people uh, because you are conscious and other of other freedom it. struggles and how important uh, freedom is and how important other human beings are uh, and how important to keep human dignity and how central it is to and the how growth important of human the beings. equality of human beings absolutely is. yeah so mm -hmm. I think that's the, I think those are the the seeds that you grow up with and I think you wouldn't have it any other way I don't know I don't know how it would be any other way but I mean I, c I come from a fairly middle-class family you, you in the fact that my father was a teacher so uh, um, you had to go abroad to, to yeah. study uh, well, it was, m earlier was it than difficult that. again well my f mother uh, had to leave uh, basically it was just after Sharpville and there was a lot of bannings and a lot of imprisonments and and essentially we this is the period when Mandela it. was on run. Yes, he was on the run, um, the, the trial, all yeah. um, oh, that early 60s period. And so we, my father, uh, you know, my father went to university and he met many new African leaders who were, who were to become ministers of education and finance in the new African independence countries. So we, he actually had a choice. We were very lucky. He had a friend who was from Botswana and from Zambia and from Tanzania. So he had a bit of a choice. And we cho he chose Zambia. And so we got on and the train. And he was determined that you should study. The turmoil was going on. I think it was more around the safety of his family. I mean, I was like. It 10. was for the safety of the family. Oh, the that safety of his family. Yeah, it was more, not only for education. Yeah, no, I think it was more at that time. It was more about the safety of his family because we were all. My eldest brother was just going to go to high school, and I was still in primary school. So we got on a train, five days on a train, this family of four and my parents, and we went from Cape Town, which is a. But the struggle went on. Yes, the struggle on, yeah. went on, and you were part of it through and through. Right well, it was childhood. a bad time, I think, for South Africa uh, in those in that late 60s, early 70s, um, because of the bannings and the and the imprisonments, and many people came out. Many people went to Zambia, actually. So there was a very large South African community in Zambia. In Zambia, and I was very lucky that there was no glass ceiling for a small black girl to do science. So in high when school... When did you decide to do science? <laughs> well, I think I've always been interested in nature and always been interested in the environment around, uh, around us and always been interested in the notion that you have such beauty and yet such poverty. So I've always had a link between nature and development, actually. Uh, Most of the scientists whom I have interviewed on my show have given the same answer. Really? Yes, uh, so, so science doesn't know really boundaries, not even color code. <laughs> or gender. <laughs> or gender yeah. bias. I have to take a break. We'll continue. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Eureka. Dr. Tanya, it's really very heartening for me that a South African fighter and a scientist is sitting uh, with me at the moment.
when you decided to do science, how hard was it in doing it in, in, in Zambia? Because the family is shifted, the life is disrupted, you are in a very different environment. Though you are saying that there were lots of South Africans already mm. there, and you know probably, you knew probably certain families who were close to you. But how hard was yeah. it to, I, I to was, do I science I was very there? lucky. In South Africa, you, um, you, we had African education and colored education and yes. Indian education and, right. you know, and, and you and were white trained. white education and... And so you were trained to be ewers of wood and bearers of water. This was the period when Bantu education, Bantu education was, was imposed yeah. on, exactly. on South Africa. And so with the result that actually there are very few women, particularly of my age, that actually did do science. And I was very lucky to go to Zambia where there was none of that glass ceiling. And so in my first year at high school, they could see my propensity for science and maths. And so I was put in that stream. And in a way, it's not so good because I didn't do art and other things which I would have loved to have done. But we, so I was in a science stream from the time I was 13, 14. And I did my O-levels. They did do O-levels right. there. And then I went to university and did biology, University of Zambia, which was a new university. You were particularly new interested people. in biology. Yes. Uh, yeah. And right they, from the beginning. Yeah. I, I, w I was interested in the environment, uh, mm. and, and I suppose biology was a way, was a way to go to environment uh, at that time. Now, of course, there are so many careers open yes. for young people, but then you, you, you decide whether you go for physics or chemistry, physics, chemistry or biology. Physics, chemistry, zoology, botany. Yes, so it's a biology, geography kind of Very strand. straight jacketed. Yeah, very straight jacketed. jacketed now there are so many interesting careers that young people can do in the field, but we usually win. And when did you decide to go to Europe? Well, I Especially finished. London, why London? Well, I finished, you know, there's a backstory, which I'm not so sure that the audience would be interested in. As always with young people, when they travel, they make decisions. But, uh, you know... Um, no, we'll be very keen to listen to that story. <laughs> the backstory, okay. Well, um, I was actually offered a... When I finished my first degree at University of Zambia, I was offered a, to do a PhD at Adelaide University in Australia and a ma well, master's at Imperial in, in London. Imperial College and London? Imperial College London, that's right. And so, I mean, like many young people, you make kind of, kind of odd decisions. And I think I chose London, one, because it just sounded more exciting than Adelaide. <laughs> and yet, Adelaide University is a very, very good romantic. university. Very yeah. Go to London. Yeah, it's to and do back it. to UCL. Yeah, to the London of the Beatles and, you know, the fun of London and all that. So, yeah, so I went to Imperial and I did a master's at Imperial College. Uh, in entomology, because actually by the end of my first degree, I was very interested in entomology. And, uh, and as always with, with why you choose certain things, it's often the teacher. And we had this fantastic teacher. The teachers teacher. shape you. No, absolutely. But this fantastic teacher. And of the 30 students in that, in that year, I think 28 of us became entomologists or epidemiologists or ecologists of some kind or the other, really because of him. So, uh, yeah. So and that's why you did your PhD also from UK. I did, yeah. Well, when I finished my master's, I, 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 I was in limbo for a little while uh, because I couldn't, um, I couldn't really go back to... Zambia is not my country, and I had a problem with my South African passport. It's a long story. But essentially, I needed to stay and study further in, in England. And I, you didn't have a South African passport at that time? Well, I had, you know, in Zambia what, what happens is that you needed to get your passport renewed at the South African embassy, and there's no South African embassy in Zambia in those frontline states. So you had to send it to Malawi where there was a South African embassy. And at some point you sent your passport and it never came back. So you, 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 have yes, you had to have different travel documents. Um, and so you, you're just in a moment when you, when the only real way to, to continue is to study. So I'm not particularly clever. I think it was because I was in a position I had to study. I'm sure if I was in another country, maybe I wouldn't have studied further. But nevertheless, I did do a PhD at the University of Westminster. Like Mandela, did you decide to go back to South Africa? Mandela said that I'll not go out of South Africa. He had to go out of South Africa on a visit. Yeah, well, ANC forced him to go. And, and campaign for, yeah. for uh, well, I had the privilege of working in Mandela's office in I was coming in, to that. in when we got democracy, but I don't think I can compare myself with him. <laughs> uh, no, I, I I couldn't go back to South Africa, and so I was very lucky to have. 
done a PhD at Westminster University, but based on research in Zambia. I went back to Zambia and did work on small-scale farmers mm. for a year. Very nice to go around and speak with small-scale farmers and look at their farming methodology and their pest management systems. And so I think then I got an interest in really looking at science and how it affects human beings. And so uh, I, I really am a strong believer that, that science needs to be innovative, needs to be uh, universal, uh, needs to be applied. That I know there's lots of value for blue sky science, but I, I do think that science needs to apply its mind towards human well-being. And I know you made that comment about the earth. But the fact of the matter is there's such a skewed distribution of who gets access to Earth's resources that, you know, if you tell a very, very poor man that, in fact, or a woman, that y you are responsible for the discussion of destruction of this Earth, I think that's unfair. The fact of the matter is that very, very poor people have not had access when to those resources. When did you start resources. crystallizing these ideas? In Zambia? Or when you came back to South Africa and, and I think South it's Africa was a, I think it's a free. mix of politics and my political background and the science that, that made me think in that way. And even when I was doing my PhD research, I was really a part of, I was part of the British, British Society for Social Responsibility in Science, for example. The, the link between science being socially responsible and being applied. And so when you came back to South Africa, and started yeah. working with Madiba. Not quite when I first came. I first yeah. came in 1991, and I worked for an NGO, an environmental NGO, Great. and did lots of work in rural areas, uh, land use. Uh, I was asking when you when you started working uh, with the first president of South yeah. Africa, Mandela or Madiba, as he's known. Yeah. Uh, had you already crystallized the ideas that you are talking about that science has to have a very strong linkage with life and that to social life? I think so, and I, I was also a, a, a member of the African National Congress, and and we and I was in the Land Commission, and we knew that issues around land and agriculture and science and investigation had to, to have a link with what we want to achieve as, uh, in a free South Africa. And you can't be in an ivory tower as scientists. And, that and this was the phase when nation building was going on. Yes. It's yeah. still going on. Oh, it's, it's, a, a, it's, a, it's very, a journey. It's a very nascent uh, <laughs> democracy that you Yes, no, very much so. As compared to most democracies yeah. in the world. And of course in India, being one of the oldest and largest democracy, we look at you at your vibrancy and your and your, your willingness to debate everything, and we admire that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that comment. Yes, it's a very vibrant and uh, bubbling democracy in the country. Uh, we'll continue the discussion. I'll have to take a break here. Don't go anywhere. We'll come back soon. Welcome back. Dr. Tanya, we were talking about South Africa and its reconstruction that was going on when you, you came back to South Africa. And then you happened to work with Madiba and... Um, most of the most important people who were involved in reconstruction of South Africa as a new nation, a child born out of struggle for democracy. And there were many, many dreams probably that were unleashed as a result of this freedom. You from a scientist became a science planner, a science policy person, a science manager in the country. How did you look at that time the future of science in South Africa? Well, first of all, I just wanted to say, you know, the power of voting for the first time unleashed an enormous amount of energy. And I think it's one of those things about the human spirit that once you vote in a democracy, uh, your voice is heard, and I think that unleashed a lot of energy. So in 1994, when uh, uh, just after the democratic elections, um, lots of energy and of people and institutions bent their mind to overcoming the horrors of apartheid in terms of uh, discriminatory housing and access to land and education, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, developing a new constitution. Uh, reforming the science institutions for development rather than for war, etc., etc. So it was a very exciting time, and I think all and of the us entire world were excited about it, yeah. and, and and everybody was 
was celebrating. I think we South thought we African could Republic. change something that had been going on for 200 years. We thought we could change it in 100 days. And so it was a very, very busy time indeed. And so the Reconstruction Development Program, I was the head of the development planning of the Reconstruction Development Fund. Uh, and uh, did, we did some amazing things. Uh, but it's a journey. It's a project. It's a, it, 20 years. We're still on that journey to reconstruct uh, and develop and overcome the inequalities of, of, of that legacy that we've got. So, uh, um, yeah. Now, uh, this institute, which is uh, Biodiversity, National Biodiversity Institute of South Africa, it's a very exciting place, uh, I understand. <laughs> and a lot of scientists around the world would like to work there. Uh, why did you think that it was very important? Is it because the reconstruction was going on and you thought personally that, that the, the, the science has to come closer to, to yeah. solving the problems of the people? Well, after I, I, I worked in the President's office about two and a half years, I, I went to be the Deputy Director General in the Environment Affairs Department. And there I was Head of Biodiversity and Heritage and Marine and Coastal Management and Tourism as well. Yeah, uh, that is amazing. Yeah. When in India you talk about tourism and science, people will be very, very skeptical. But in South Africa, probably because of the legacy of, of the olden days of environment affecting on daily basis individuals life it's because of that that science was was a well, part I, I, of tourism all no I, I, I tourism south african tourism uh is a major asset and it's really based on our natural capital and our natural assets and in fact tourism is one of the best ways to conserve nature and when people enjoy it and people see it and they want to uh, experience it and therefore they become pressure groups to not destroy it and that is the most cost effective way i think of protecting this amazing natural asset that we have and and you know many of our countries including india has such high biodiversity such amazing natural capital and yet we also have such high poverty and inequality and so we must use that asset to overcome this issue why is it that we live in such beauty and yet have such inequality and poverty so tourism for me is one of the major sustainable use issues in 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 in, in, in natural resource management and so um, but I during the time when and I was that is how you ensure the participation of various communities to save biodiversity. Yes, and that's why South Africa has one of the, the, the really quite a, 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 a high-end, let me just say, environmental management system. And everybody was saying, why do you want to go into such a complex environmental management system? But the communities wanted it. There was a view that environment was very important. And even during the liberation movement, environment there was an important element of uh, of what we were struggling for, access to the environment, access to natural resources, access to this beauty. Because you remember under apartheid, people were moved into Bantustans uh, in, the, in, in the driest and most unproductive parts of South Africa. So it's a very emotive thing, so we've always felt that way. The way you look at biodiversity today and how it should be saved has brought you to international arena. Just you are one of the advisors, science policy advisor to Secretary General United Nations. How do you think that it's going to influence the, the international community? Well, I... Will you, are you confident that it will happen? <laughs> well, I'm very honored. There are some very, very clever people there, including some uh, 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 Indian scientists who are world-renowned. I mean, you can hardly breathe in their presence. They are so clever. <laughs> Uh, but I hope that w what I will bring is a view about the democratization of science right? and that, that it must be more accessible and more an activity that children can do, that your grandmother can do, that the inquiry and investigation about how things work and how to solve problems is what science is about. It's not an ivory tower thing. It's not a thing for the elite. Nehru called it scientific temper. Okay. Right. Yes, well, he was another clever man. And, and, and so that we can become a, a citizens that are investigative, that are curious, that want to solve problems through experiment, through investigation, through surveys. And so we can democratize science so that we can become more scientific. And I think for developing countries, for South Africa, 
I think India has more of that tradition than we have. You don't have that kind of history where that investigation and education and learning has been a little bit knocked out of many of our communities. Uh, experience right from struggle to heading the institute which you are heading, uh, being one of the key pillars of institute like uh, Mistra, which is think tank of South Africa, and then international arena. What message would you like to give to the younger generation? Uh, do you think they should do science or they should be doing making money? I think, I think all young people should do science in one way or the other, natural science, social science, investigation, see how the world works, be curious, listen to history, uh, make plans for the future. I think that's what young people are there for. I have three young daughters, uh, they're not so young, well my eldest is 30 and my youngest is 21, but I th I'm hoping, that none of them are natural scientists, they've all done other things, but I'm hoping that that's the, the ethos and the, that, that, that young people should have, to be curious, to want to change the world for better, for, for not to be complacent about the situation we, we give them, that they inherit from us, and that they want to change it for the better. And I've been very privileged to have been able to head up the South African National Biodiversity Institute for the last seven, eight years. Uh, I have marvelous staff of very clever scientists. And we also run the National Botanical Garden System of South Africa. So there's a tourism element there as well. And the aim is to display, give windows to biodiversity for urban people so right. that they can enjoy uh, this uh, natural asset that we have, particularly in those countries of the South, like South Africa and India. So enjoy the biodiversity, enjoy the resources, but don't plunder them. That is the message yes. that the younger generation 